I specifically asked Chris Green to come and to talk about something that she mentioned at Mylon Data Conference, was that we don't necessarily want to get rid of biofilms. We talk about biofilms being part of the culprit, but we don't necessarily want to get rid of them because they play a role in a healthy human body. And then the other thing that she said that struck me as interesting, that there are certain herbs that will shut down the efflux pumps. So I thought that it would be interesting to have her expand on those two points today. So thank you. And um, it's a little expansion, but I think of it as in the mystery, and, and Ray mentioned several times the word stealth. These, these bacteria are very stealthy. You know, we thought we beat the bacteria. It's a little arrogant that we thought so, but when antibiotics were really coming out and, and we didn't think we had to worry. The virus, yeah, you know, AIDS appeared, etc. But this is a quote from a paper called Frontal and Stealth Attack Strategies in Microbial Pathogenesis, and it's really called Stealth Pathogens. And so interactions between microbes and human hosts can range from a benign, even symbiotic, collaboration to a competition that may turn fatal, resulting in death of the host, the microbe, or both. Despite advances that have been made over the past decades in understanding microbial pathogens, more people worldwide still die every year from infectious disease than from any other cause. I'm an ecologist. I majored in ecology. So I really think about systems a lot. And we, we evolve, but the bugs evolve a lot faster. <laughs> and in the ideal world, we're all symbiotes, right? Everything's happy and, and we're all living. So one of the things that I learned long ago at a Fallon conference by a guy named Kosterton, who's called the father of biofilms, is that almost all bacteria live in a biofilm. They live in what's called a sessile. They're settled. They aren't floating around the blood or floating around the fluids. They're living in community. Almost all organisms, no matter what level you are, actually live in communities. And what's very interesting is almost biofilms form in a very set way. You have fungi in them that are provide, they're like the beams, they're like holding up the structure of it. And then the, the gram positives move in and then the gram negatives move in. And they have neighborhoods. They have a neighborhood that's aerobic and a neighborhood that's anaerobic. pH can vary hugely within a biofilm, which which the amount of pH difference, if that was generalized to the blood, you'd be dead. So it's very interesting that these organisms are living happily in us in community, and it's probably what keeps us healthy, right? We have the human biome in the gut, which is a big deal right now, and it's almost like it's an organism or an organ in itself. It's kind of like anyone who knows the ant story. You know, one little ant is really just part of this huge organism that is the ant hill, if you read Wilson, etc. So I've said this before, so I, forgive me if you've heard it before. When I saw the um, EM micrographs of biofilms, I thought, this is the next blob. It's so scary. They're like these huge, gelatinous, gunky things. And, and they're communications. They're like telephones between the organisms. They can talk to us, ourselves. They can talk to each other. It doesn't have to be the same species, but they talk a lot to their neighborhood. And funny things happen in a biofilm. All of a sudden, all the bugs will move one way. They all go down to one end. Maybe the food's there, maybe the chow's on. Maybe the other end has something dangerous. And biofilms protect our good guys, if you will, from the white cells. The white cells can't get in. In these micrographs, you see the white cells lined up against the biofilm, which is made of hyaluronic acid, which is the same thing in your joints. It's really sticky and, and gluey. Oh, and the stable biofilms are made of lots of different organisms. Now. Lime can also make a biofilm. It does it in a test tube. Shappy and I think Zhang now have both found it in blood, so it does seem to be normal. 
but it's a single organism biofilm. So it's not as stable, but maybe that's how the bug gets its foothold. Maybe, you know, that way it's protected from the antibiotic early or your white cells early, so it kind of gets in. And my question, and I think what intrigued Lorraine, is do those pathogens, those potential pathogens, move into our biofilms? And, you know, Lyme's a great imitator. Maybe kind of knocks on the door and moves in and says, I'm Joe, remember me? You know, maybe there's something that it can do to imitate and thereby get our own biofilms protecting it. Um, and until I think we really understand uh, how biofilms are part of normal life and health, um, maybe we can't quite figure out how these persistent bugs, these stealth pathogens, are, are worming into our bodies. So the original biofilms are found in oil slicks, and they got very interested in them because they were messing with oil. So they very quickly got, got funding to study them, <laughs> unlike <laughs> in the, the human problem. body. <laughs> But a guy named Garth Ehrlich, who's now at Drexel, found that there are biofilms in the ear infections. You know, when I went to med school, I learned that really ear infections weren't usually bacterial. They were viral. You couldn't culture any bugs from them. Well, it's because they're in biofilms, because you take the fluid out of the ear. And no, you can't. But if you, if you scrape, then you find out there's a whole myriad, there's a whole group of bugs in there causing many of those ear infections. Uh -huh. And so a lot, yeah, a lot of our view of biofilms in the body have come from things we put in the body, which we worry about because sometimes we put a plastic tube in the bloodstream <laughs> so as to administer IV antibiotic. And very quickly, things will try to grow on it and become a biofilm. And if you have a knee replacement or a hip replacement, maybe a cardiac valve, that also appears to happen. So that's where a lot of our studies have done. So efflux pumps um, are something that almost all cells have, not just bacterial cells. They've been there much longer than man-made antibiotics, and they pump out things from the bacteria or sometimes from our cells, though they're different pumps in different kinds of prokaryotes like a bacteria and eukaryotes like we are. They pump out heavy metals, poisonous stuff like organophosphates, botanical products that are toxic, which there are a lot of, and then they also, interestingly, I didn't mention this in biofilms, but biofilms, I told you, things will move. They'll suddenly all move south or all move north. There's a signal that has been picked up. It's called a quorum sensing. So, so a signal goes out that tells them what to do. You know, your neighbor says there's a fire down there, move away or something. And these pumps actually put those signals out. So they're very functional part of bacteria, but they also kick out the antibiotics, and they kick them out fast. And when I first learned about these, I thought maybe that's why we have to give so much antibiotic in Lyme, right? We have to keep giving in, and we have to give it a long time. And part of it is this cyst formation they do, or this persister formation, um, and kind of outlasting however long you're putting the antibiotic in, like Ray said. But, but perhaps it's also that they keep kicking it out. But the size of the genome is directly proportional to the number of pump genes. Now, Borrelia burgdorferi, I believe, is the biggest genome in the bacterial group. But the, the genes that code for the efflux pumps mostly are not on plasmids. They're mostly part of the DNA. They, they are preserved. They, they developed a long time ago. And if you think about it, it makes sense because there are things in nature that are trying to, you know, limit the attack. Plants get eaten too, roots get eaten too, and they're also symbiotic relationship. Life is life, you know, whether it's plant life or animal life. We all have bacteria to deal with. And so another interesting thing I found is what Lorraine mentioned. There are substances that are being used that affect 
those pumps. Um, and a very big area of drug development right now is looking at bringing some botanicals into the antibiotic. And I mentioned silver later. We can think about that. But so the PPIs, the proton pump inhibitors, which you and I would probably think about as an antacid to treat an ulcer or something like that. Oh, that's interesting. They actually have yeah. strong antifungal. They have selective antibacterial, sometimes against spirochetes. So one of the things that's frequently said in Lyme is the reason doxycycline or azithromycin work is because they're anti-inflammatory. But no one has ever told me that the reason the PPI works is because it's antibacterial. And we certainly know that most ulcers <laughs> are caused by H. pylori. They're caused by a spirochetal bacteria. Um, same with some of the antidepressants or the anxiolytics, the, the drugs that, can, uh, that are psychiatric in nature. Um, now, some of these, the phenothiazines, you'd have to use a whole lot of them. They'd probably be toxic to, to stop that pump, but not true of the serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which we give all the time. And in fact, that's what the IDSA suggests we give our post-Lyme disease syndrome patients because they're depressed, so we should give them serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Maybe we're helping a little bit by disabling the pump, but it probably helps more if you give doxycycline with it. <laughs> and then verapamil, which is a, a cardiac drug, also inhibits a pump, so it's very interesting. One of my pet peeves is that we name drugs by their function as opposed to thinking about what the drugs actually do, uh, thinking about basic pharmacology, because we think we're giving it to, you know, get the arrhythmia and the heart down. But if we really understand the chemistry and the pharmacology of the drug, we could probably help people out a whole lot more, use less drug, target it a little bit better. So hot area of research, berberine. I don't know if you know berberine. It's, so the berberines are a group of chemicals that come from leaf extract, so olive leaf extract, which is actually a very good anti antifungal, but it's a little toxic, um, or Oregon grape extract. Those have activity against fungus and activity against some bacteria, and they're used a lot in botanical medicine. Well, berberine, which is golden seal leaf extract, actually is a very good bacterial pump inhibitor, and they're, they're incorporating it in studies to see what they can link it up with. Palmitine coptis is one of the things we use for Babesia, um, coptis root. And it's, it's quite effective, and it also, to my surprise, has something in it that will block that pump. And then this is not a botanical, but tigacycline is basically a tetracycline that has a pump inhibitor in it. And it makes people sick as a dog, but it also appears sometimes to totally cure Lyme without anything else needed. Silver. Silver is interesting that a lot of people are using colloidal silver. I've used it for years. My impression is it doesn't work very well, except topically. Like if you've got a sinusitis or if you're getting on a plane and it's a long flight and you want to not get what everyone else has, take a little nasal spray of colloidal silver and use it a lot. But interestingly, silver does make the membrane, this is not a pump issue, it does make the membrane of the bacteria more able to absorb. Some of the gram-negative bacteria are very resistant to picking up the drug because they're big, they're big molecules. And this will make the, the membrane more leaky. And in this particular article, which I didn't put down there, um, they actually had in vivo and in vitro studies. Now, the way they treated, they gave the mice peritonitis, and then they injected silver into the, the per peritoneum as opposed to giving them it orally. And my impression oh, of yeah. silver has been that it's probably an absorption issue. It's probably hard to absorb this stuff. But silver 
upregulate. So this was interesting, the copper efflux pump. Remember I said that it, the pumps will also kick out heavy metals. Copper is not a heavy metal, but it'll kick out metals that may be toxic. Um, and so this could also be, I was thinking why silver seems a plus minus is actually it upregulates one of the pumps, so it's kick it out more. So methods of modulating efflux pumps, which again, this is a big area of research in pharmacology. You can block energy production. If they don't have energy, <laughs> they can't run the pump. It, you know, so you come in and you block ATP, they're looking at that. Now that's a pretty potentially dangerous thing to do, but again, because the bacteria is a little different than the eukaryote, maybe they can do it. You can trap iron, and I don't know if you know, but, but one of the board question is, you know, if you have someone who has a raging infection and, and they're anemic and their iron's low, um, is the problem that they're anemic and their iron's low? And the answer is no, you don't give them any iron because the bacteria are eating it. <laughs> and so you can trap iron, cut that energy production, and knock out the pumps. They're also looking at biologics, you know, the specific antibodies. These are the very expensive, new, quite often dangerous, um, but effective sometimes drugs that would go just just take out the pump by being targeted right to it. Um, and then the other thing they're looking at, and they actually have done a fair amount of this, is using an antibiotic that's a little bit different. They just tweak it, and it has more affinity for the pump. So the pump's knocking out really the dummy so that the real antibiotic can sneak in. And these are kind of things they do. I think that's the last slide. But There's you your should last slide. Okay. Thank <laughs> you.